Welcome and good morning everyone. I'm Alison Rose. I'm Chief of Place, Space and Communities Division here at Geoscience Australia. I, alongside Erica Tadurin, are the champions of gender equity here at GA. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting on today, and that is the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge and respect their culture and contribution uh, to the land, to this land. And I welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here today, in particular First Nations women. We're here today to mark International Women's Day, which was celebrated across the world yesterday. This movement started more than 100 years ago when only eight countries allowed women to vote and equal pay for equal work was unheard of. Today, we have a chance to celebrate how far we've come, but also how far we still have to go. This year, the theme is changing climates, equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. This theme recognises and celebrates the contribution of women and girls around the world who are working to change the climate of gender equality and build a sustainable future, particularly in the field of science and technology. And there are many such uh, women here at Geoscience Australia, including the three that you'll get to, to know uh, during the course of this seminar. This theme is especially relevant to International Women's Day because while climate change will touch every person across the, the globe, it disproportionately impacts women. Women constitute the majority of the world's poor, so are more vulnerable when the natural resources they depend on for their livelihoods are threatened by climate change. Around 21 and a half a million people worldwide are displaced every year by climate change related events. And of that 21 and a half million, 80% are women. At least 1.2 billion people could be displaced by climate related events by 2050. So if we take the current ratio and, and kind of move it forward, then we could see can, around 960 million women that could be impacted by climate related events by 2050. Additionally, women and children are 14 times more likely than men to die or be injured from natural disasters, which are only increasing due to climate change. But while women suffer due to these events, they are also key to the solution. By harnessing the skills and knowledge of women and girls, we can create a healthier, more sustainable planet. Here at Geoscience Australia, our Diversity and Inclusion Strategy 2025 articulates our efforts to amplify the skills and knowledge of women. By creating an environment that is respectful and equal, we're carving out a space where women play a key role in shaping our future. We've already made great strides on this journey, but we have some further measures to share with you today that will further that goal. I'll now pass over to my fellow gender equity champion, Erica Tadurin, to learn more. So over to you, Erica. Thanks very much, Ali. Um, at Geoscience Australia, we value the diversity of our employees and aim to provide a pr uh, positive and supportive workplace. We know that in order to drive scientific innovation and discovery, we need to draw on the full pool of human talent and help them achieve their full potential. To support this, yesterday we launched a new domestic and family violence policy and procedure as part of our International Women's Day celebrations. We have resources and an e-learning uh, module which will equip all staff to have a role in providing a safe, respectful and supportive workplace for people who are experiencing or using domestic and family violence. I'm also really happy to announce that we've opened a family room facility on level one of our Simonston, Simonston building. The room will be made available where staff are impacted by family violence can work safely with their child or children with them. These actions will make Geoscience Australia a more equitable, inclusive and supportive workplace going into the future. I'm also pleased to announce that we've stepped up our efforts to eliminate sexism and sexual harassment at Geoscience Australia by adding a new e-learning module on our Learn at GA tool. This module will support us 
um, as we all have a valuable role to play in ending gender inequality in the workplace. It'll provide us with the tools and the knowledge about how to respond in these situations and help us create a safe and inclusive work environment for all. This just adds to the incredible progress DR Science Australia has made for women in the past year. We've established diversity and inclusion champions in our senior leadership team. And this has increased the shared and visible leadership across our organisation. We've also achieved accreditation as a breastfeeding friendly workplace with the Australian Breastfeeding Association to better support breastfeeding mothers transitioning back into our workplace. We've improved reporting processes around sexual harassment and sexism through an awareness campaign that we ran and the delivery of an anonymous reporting hotline. Both Ali and I want to acknowledge and thank everyone for their fantastic contributions in creating an inclusive culture and we look forward to continuing this journey with you. I also just want to remind everyone that any of, if any of this information has raised issues for you, you can reach out to the National Sexual Assault Family and Domestic Violence Counselling Line, 1800 RESPECT or 1800 737 732. And if you're a DO Science Australia staff member, you can also contact our Employee Assistance Program or reach out to our HR colleagues. I'm now going to hand over to you, Matthew, and our panellists. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ali and Erica. Um, it's so great to see Geoscience Australia, our organisation, take strides in creating a more equitable and welcoming workplace for everyone. Um, and I know that the new domestic and family violence procedure, along with the new family room facility, um, will contribute greatly in supporting the psychological safety for all our staff. As a bit of an introduction, my name is Matthew Tay. And I'm very excited to be here to moderate um, this panel conversation today. I'm the Executive Officer to Geoscience Australia's Chief Scientist, um, but wearing a different hat today, um, I'm also the Deputy Chair of the Gender Equity Network at Geoscience Australia. Um, some of you may know this as Jenga. Um, and I'm proud to support the initiatives that you've just heard of um, about our organisation's efforts towards um, greater equity for all, for all genders. Um, in celebrating International Women's Day and in consciously recognising the women who have contributed um, so much to the development of science, um, Jenga's Women's Network have designed a panel to highlight and celebrate some of the amazing women working at Geoscience Australia. Our panellists come from a diverse range of professional backgrounds and are all brilliant science professionals in their own rights, working in their own ways to create a more sustainable world and move the dial on gender equity. So without further ado, let's meet them. Um, I'll start off by introducing um, Dr. Alex Post, who is a marine geoscientist from the the Marine Antarctic Geoscience Section of Geoscience Australia's National Earth and Marine Observations Branch. Um, she completed a PhD within the Institute of Antarctic and Southern Ocean Studies at the University of Tasmania in 2004 and has been with Geoscience Australia in Canberra since 2002. Dr Post's research focuses on understanding marine processes to investigate how the physical characteristics of the environment influence seafloor ecosystems. She has worked on the continental slope and slope in regions spanning the northern tropics of Australia through the temperate regions and south to Antarctica to the, to the southern pole. She has also sailed on 10 research voyages with three to the Antarctic margin and her work contributes to marine protected area planning and helps scientists and marine managers to better understand and protect marine biodiversity. So just a quick question for you, Alex, how did you get into the field? And more importantly, can you get me on a boat to Antarctica? <laughs> If I had a dollar for every person who asked me that, Matthew, I'd be really rich. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I've had a, a, a long passion about Antarctica growing up. That was, you know, always my dream was to go to Antarctica. I never really had a clear idea how I was going to get there. But growing up, I loved the outdoors. I loved 
hiking. And so I always imagined myself in a career where I had that opportunity to engage with the natural world. But I grew up in a, in a family of scientists. My father was a, a research scientist. He was a botanist. My sister was paving her way in a, a research career in geology. I was actually quite determined that I was not going to be a scientist. I wanted to forge my own path. <laughs> but I really enjoyed geography when I was in high school. And so I decided to um, enroll in a Bachelor of Arts and Science at ANU doing geography and also I was really interested in anthropology. So I set off on that path, but during my first year geography classes, I actually found a real passion for wanting to understand Earth's processes and how that affects the living systems that they are supporting. And I realized that actually, if I wanted to delve into this in more detail, then really the most sensible pathway was to set foot in the geology department. <laughs> so in my second year, I actually um, enrolled in, in first year geology and I really loved that opportunity in both geography and geology to, to get out into those natural landscapes and to understand them better. When I was coming to the end of my bachelor's degree, I came across a poster which was advertising an honours program in Antarctic studies. And I thought that you know, that was just the perfect opportunity not only to follow my dream in, in understanding Antarctica, but also to get out into the Tassie wilderness and do some great bushwalks. <laughs> so I signed up and, and moved down to Tasmania. And that honours year was really my first opportunity to, to experience what research is like. And I really loved that opportunity to delve into a subject and understand it in detail. And so Despite my earlier um, sense that I really didn't want to go down an academic pathway, which I thought is what a PhD would lead to, I decided to, to embark on a PhD because I just loved that research. I also had quite a lot of um, parts of the Tasmanian wilderness that I hadn't explored yet, so that was a really <laughs> great opportunity to stay in Tasmania. And it also led to my, my first opportunity to visit Antarctica myself. Great. Thanks so much for sharing, Alex, and completely identify with just having read one too many National Geographic articles, <laughs> one too many hikes, and then all of a sudden you're a geologist. Um, <laughs> without further ado, we'll move on to our next panellist, Dr. Saleh McAlpine, who is the Director of the Strategic Basin Section in the Advice Investment Attraction and Analysis Branch at Geoscience Australia. Saleh has 10 years of experience leading and contributing to pre-competitive geoscience research programs within the Australian government and has significant international science engagement experience. She's had a number of roles at Geoscience Australia, including leading the integration and prospectivity team in the mineral systems branch and as the inaugural executive officer to the CEO and as the director of Digital Earth Africa. Saleh has a Bachelor of Science in Honours um, and a PhD in Igneous and Mantle Petrology from the Research School of Earth Sciences at the Australian National University. So just a question for you, Saleh. Between your work in the mineral section to leading Digital Earth Africa, you have such a broad experience um, across the fields of geoscience. Is this something that you ever envisioned yourself doing when you were younger? Thanks, Matthew. Well, I'm um, not a dissimilar story in some ways, uh, except for the fact that I grew up on a tiny volcanic island in the South Pacific Ocean. And so I too had a natural uh, appreciation for the wonderful world um, around me and the beauty that nature brings. So I loved everything from, you know, the mighty Pacific Ocean um, to the crystal clear sky and the stars that I could see above my head. So I always had an appreciation for that detail. And what I found was that science was a way to be able to understand it um, at a level that um, I needed um, to, to fulfill my curiosity. And so I found that um, 
enrolling in a Bachelor of Science at the ANU was also the way to pursue that love. I actually came to uh, Canberra to the ANU to pursue astrophysics, um, but it was that multidisciplinary um, science um, of geology that sucked me in. <laughs> Dare I say it's a little more tangible um, than the stars above, um, but it was, yeah, it was very much a way to um, combine my loves of mathematics, physics and chemistry um, and see some fantastic parts of the world um, that brought me down to the geology path. So when I started a career at Geoscience Australia, um, minerals was my was my love. Um, but I think combined with that natural curiosity um, and that love for multidisciplinary science, also a little bit of a predisp predisposition um, to say yes to every opportunity and challenge, um, uh, a more diverse career within the geosciences certainly makes sense. Thanks so much, Sarla. I think that's also a pretty common story about going to university for one thing and then all of a sudden finding earth science to just be really, really interesting and a lot more hands on. Thanks so much, Sarla. Um, and so now we'll move on to our final panellist, um, Alice Ryder, whose career started with a bang uh, when she accidentally set the floor on fire at the ANU um, and then exploded an eight metre long whale rescue dummy in Tasmania. Alice Ryder is currently Geoscience Australia's Manager of Client and Visitor Services within the Office of the Chief Scientist. Her team acts as the front door for Geoscience Australia um, and answers thousands of inquiries from the public each year. Alice combines her love of storytelling and a fascination with nature through a degree in environmental science and postgraduate studies in science communication. She has spent almost 20 years across working Australia with farmers, tourists, children, and traditional owners helping to interpret science and make it more meaningful. Her career highlights have included leading audience research projects to redefine how museums tell stories about geology and geography and lecturing in science communication at the Australian National University while running the Science Circus, which is Questacon's largest outreach program. So Alice, um, what's the story behind the exploding whale? I knew that was dangerous to mention that. Um, uh, I also have a bit of a Tasmania link, Alex, so we might have to do some debriefing about our favourite hikes later. Um, straight after I finished university, I moved to northwestern Tasmania, where I worked as a regional land care facilitator. My job was to help farmers incorporate the latest scientific knowledge and research about agricultural productivity and environmental management into their farming practice. As part of that work, um, I had a huge stall at a place called AgFest, which is Tasmania's largest agricultural field day. It attracts about 60,000 visitors in three days. And we had displays about soil health, activities for kids, a GIS mapping station, but our star attraction, the thing to put cook people in, was a brand new eight metre long whale rescue dummy. So if you imagine uh, a bike in a tube, but that is a uh, sort of hip height and eight metres long and has a tail and fins and is painted to look like a whale, it's then filled up with water so it weighs several tonnes. Our whale rescue dummies uh, were used for coast care groups to practice uh, whale rescue drills on the beach to help beached whales. So it was our brand new thing. It was the debut. We set it all up. It was beautiful. The state newspaper took a photo of it and actually ran it on the front page of the statewide newspaper saying, come to Agfest, see the cool whale. Uh, we came back the next morning at 5 a.m. ready to go and the whale was nowhere to be seen. It disappeared. But the ground was very, very wet and we found strips of rubber that had exploded everywhere. We eventually found out the whale hadn't been built to spec uh, and hadn't been tested with the full amount of water. So it had catastrophically exploded overnight. It must have scared some of the very poor animals at Agfest quite a lot. Um, in a big rush, we got the old West rescue whale up from Hobart, but he was pretty ugly. He looked more like a worm. Uh, so we tried to lean into it. We nicknamed him Wormy and he linked with our soil testing activities. But I think the learning was that you should test things out before you debut them. Thanks, Alice. I'd be interested um, in getting the thoughts of the project manager who was tasked with constructing um, that whale rescue dummy. Um, what an interesting task. Um, anyway, um, well, what an amazing breadth of experience that we have with us today. Um, and now we'll be delving a bit deeper into the UN Women's theme for International Women's Day this year, which is on changing climates, equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. 
So to start things off, um, Alex, you must have seen some incredible changes in the Antarctic environment um, due to climate change. And can you tell us a bit more about the work that you're doing here at Geoscience Australia um, and how it's helping to understand the impact of climate change on the environment? Does being in the environment really demonstrate what's at risk? Yeah, thanks, Matthew. So as I mentioned, you know, the key focus of my work is on the Antarctic margin. And I'm really interested in the sea floor and what it reveals to us when we map it in detail. And so when I'm on a research voyage, that's what I'm interested in is, is mowing the lawn, as we say, going up and down with the, with the research vessel to get that high resolution bathymetry data from our multi-beam echo sounders. And so what this reveals to us is not only just how deep that ocean is beneath us, but what shape it takes. And the shape that the seafloor takes is influenced by a whole lot of processes. But on the Antarctic margin, one of those key processes is the previous expansion of the Antarctic ice sheet across the continental shelf during past glaciations, and then its retreat back across that, that surface. And that creates a whole lot of features that we can use to understand those past processes. And so we can see written onto the sea floor that past history of, of change in the Antarctic ice sheet that helps us to understand some of what how it might respond to future change. The other reason why we really need to understand the sea floor bathymetry is because it really governs the oceanography in that region. So one of the, the greatest vulnerabilities of the Antarctic ice sheet is to actually having, having warm water come in beneath it and start to, to eat away at it, to melt it from the bottom and to destabilize it. So this is something that we've already observed in West Antarctica to, to quite a large degree already, that we're seeing these, these deep ocean currents that are relatively warm, that are actually you know, warm enough to, to start eating away at those glaciers. And where those glaciers are most vulnerable is where they're actually grounded beneath sea level. And on the East Antarctic margin where our work is focused, we have the deepest ice in Antarctica. It's, it's thousands of metres below sea level is where this ice is sitting. And so that makes it extremely vulnerable to any warm waters that might be able to get to the base of those ice sheets. So by mapping out the continental shelf, we can understand where those valleys or troughs might be that actually can allow that, that warm water mass into beneath the ice sheet, destabilizing it and potentially leading to some really rapid changes in that ice and really rapid melt. And with you know tens of meters of sea level within the Antarctic ice sheet, it, it really is you know, a risk that we need to, to take seriously and to understand. Thanks, Alex. Um, I was going to say, if only mowing the normal lawn was so insightful and so interesting, <laughs> but it also sounds a lot more harrowing. <laughs> um, moving to monitoring environmental change um, over a completely different continent, um, I'd like to now defer to Saleh um, as the inaugural director of the Digital Earth Africa program. So Saleh, um, can you tell us a little bit more about Digital Earth Africa and how are programs like this um, helping to improve sustainability? Thanks, Matthew. Well, the tagline of Digital Earth Africa is unlocking the promise of tomorrow using the patterns of the past. And I think that really sums up um, Earth observation and the power it holds um, for this topic. So Digital Earth Africa is based on the technologies um, developed in Digital Earth Australia here at Geoscience Australia. Um, and it's, it's an African um, service that will be developed to you know, stack that earth observation data over time, all of those images, to be able to see changes in the environment, um, whether that be environmental or the built environment, see changes in um, water bodies, wetlands, coast, um, and use all of that information over time to be able to inform decisions for a more sustainable tomorrow. So it's certainly a very powerful tool that will be um, 
in action in the African continent um, and it will be used by people um, in government, decision making, policy making roles, uh, to civil society, um, to private sector, to be able to inform um, their decisions based on an evidence base based on Earth observations. So it's a very powerful tool um, and certainly um, will be able to uh, inform the changes in both, you know, the challenges that come in the social, economic and environmental um, situation, um, which we all have to, um, we all have to make um, to, yeah, really enable good decisions for sustainability and a sustainable future. Yeah, thanks, Sale. Um, And you've also worked recently in a similar space, at least in terms of sustainability, and that's in critical minerals. Can you tell us a little bit more about the importance of critical minerals in the fight to combat climate change and some of the challenges and opportunities there? Yeah, it's not a problem, Matthew. Uh, critical minerals is a really interesting topic. Um, the, even the definition is quite interesting. So really simplistically, um, a critical mineral is something that um, has high demand, um, strategic importance, but has vulnerability to supply. So different countries across the world will have a different definition of what is a critical mineral for them. So politically and um, strategically, um, they're a really interesting group of natural resources, metals, non-metals, elements. But technological change has certainly been driving this demand for this new group of elements. Um, these critical minerals are used in everything from uh, electric cars, batteries, solar panels, wind turbines. So you can see some of these technologies are certainly the solution or a part of the solution towards a, a low carbon future. Uh, so I think in that um, particular theme, it is clear that understanding where the critical minerals are, how to extract them, how to supply them to meet that global demand is certainly a challenge. For Australia, it's an opportunity. There's, um, there's no secret that Australia has significant mineral wealth. Um, however, critical minerals typically form um, with other elements in ores. So even the extraction and separation of them can be a challenge. So there's technological challenges um, to, to uh, creating this supply chain, um, but certainly understanding and defining and mapping the mineral prospectivity of them in an Australian sense will assist in uh, one part of that chain to meet this global demand. Great, thanks, Sale. Um, and so moving on to some of the broader opportunities and challenges um, with science, geoscience in general, um, one of the biggest challenges facing the scientific community is about communicating climate change beyond scientific fact into something that's actually embedded into the community psyche. So Alice, um, as a former lecturer in science communication, what advice did you give um, to your students on this front? That's a really big question that probably needs more than a few minutes to answer properly. If I could have been that speedy lecturer, I reckon I should have got a pay rise. Um, so I won't answer your question completely, but I will say one or two things. What I'd say first is that one of the reasons that climate change is, a, is really hard to communicate effectively is that it doesn't make a good story. Um, humans are wired to lack stories. And when we tell stories, we like to have a clear goodie and a clear baddie, a clear hero and villain. So if you think Harry Potter and Lord Voldemort or John McClane and Hans Gruber, climate change doesn't have one big baddie. There's lots and lots of different things that contribute to climate change. And a lot of energy can be wasted in debates about which sectors have the biggest impact and which sectors should lead first in terms of making changes. We also really like clear causal relationships in our stories. We want things to happen for a reason. Uh, and the difference between climate and weather can make this really confusing for the general public. For example, we're told that in Australia and in Canberra, generally speaking, climate change means it's gonna get hotter in Canberra. But this year for anyone who's lived here, and my, my apologies for anyone who lives elsewhere, we basically haven't had a summer. We've had a long, dreary, rainy spring since about August, and it's still continuing. Um, so 
that variability makes a story about climate change confusing without those clear causal relationships. And sometimes it makes um, the story seem less trustworthy for non-experts. And finally, we don't like stories that don't have an ending or that have an unjust ending. So Netflix knows this better than everybody. That's why they leave episodes on a hook and then you go, oh my gosh, I have to know what happens next. And then suddenly it's three in the morning and you've binged a whole series. The problem with climate change is we don't know how it's going to end. We don't know the end of the story. There are lots of different models to talk about where we could go with climate change, depending on lots of different behaviours. Also, really heartbreakingly, even if we do take really, really big actions promptly, we can't be certain that we'll, we'll avert catastrophic outcomes. And this sense of uncertainty and unfairness sits really uneasily with people. So that's all to say that communicating about climate change is really hard. Um, so coming to your question about what is something that I would tell my students, what is a tip that I would give them or to give scientists more broadly, I would say don't be afraid to use emotion. And what I mean by that is that as both scientists and public servants, I get to wear both of those hats, they can feel quite heavy at times. We're often taught that being professional means staying calm and logical and rational, presenting facts and letting facts speak for themselves. If we get emotional, we can be seen as unprofessional or like we've let the other side of the argument get the better of us. And there's actually an interesting gender intersection here too, where women are often told that they're being too emotional. I've certainly been told that previously. But the thing is, for most members of the public, people are more compelled by an emotional argument than one that's just based on facts and figures. People who suggest we shouldn't take action around climate change often use highly emotional arguments. They'll say things like, uh, it'll mean the end of four wheel drives. You won't be allowed to have a four wheel drive anymore and you'll have, you, you won't have quality time with your family on the weekend. It'll be the end of, you know, things that we value and that make us happy. And we remember how we felt about things that happened to us for a lot longer than we remember exactly what someone said or the facts of things that were said. So I'm not advocating fear campaigns and uh, I'm not advocating that we, we make things up at all, but I think it's okay to include some sincere emotion in your communication. There was an incredibly moving project that was run by a master's student at the ANU called Is This How You Feel? And he asked climate scientists around the word, world to hand write stories about how they felt about climate change. Not that they knew about it, but how they felt. It was incredibly moving. So I'd encourage my students and all scientists to think about communicating with their minds and their hearts when they're talking about climate change. Thanks, Alice. Um, that's really, really interesting. I don't think, um, well, it'd be useful potentially to take a leaf out of Netflix's book um, and describe climate change as an unfolding Netflix saga. <laughs> Um, stay tuned, I guess. Um, but thanks also for touching on the role of um, gender equity, which we'll explore a bit more now. Um, so looking a bit more internally at us, um, Geoscience Australia as an organisation, I'm keen to know from the panel, what role do you think women in STEM institutions can play in building the sustainability of organisations? So, um, and Alice, considering you've worked at um, a number of different organisations across Australia, how have you seen the role of gender equity affect the sustainability of business or the organisation um, itself? That's a really interesting question. And with a background in environmental science, I like environmental sustainability, but this is a really another way, another interesting way to look at sustainability. There have been lots of studies around the world that show that Fortune 500 companies and similar large high profile companies that include women in their leadership teams perform better than those with all male leadership teams. I'm not personally completely across the correlation versus causation in those studies, but what I do know is that Geoscience Australia is doing its work for the benefits of all Australians and it partners with people right across Australia. And we can absolutely practice our empathy skills and imagine what people who are different to us, whether that's different in terms of a different gender or a different background or a different lived experience, want or need, but empathy can only go so far. We'll work more effectively and sensitively with a diverse Australian population and we'll build relationships better if our own organisation is diverse and we can bring different ideas to the table. Personally, when I worked on the redevelopment of the Western Australian Museum, our team was super diverse. Um, we were pretty much gender balanced. Uh, it included people of a wide range of ages and also who had traveled to Australia from all over the world. For example, when I started in my role, 
I was a 25 year old woman uh, with both English and Wiradjuri ancestry. And I sat next to a gentleman in his late fifties from North Carolina. So very, very different people with very, very different backgrounds. To be honest, building diverse teams uh, means that those teams often come to conclusions more slowly. It often takes us more time to get to an endpoint because we need to work through and interrogate more points of view. And sometimes there's more conflict along the way. I think we need to be honest about that. Building sustainable teams is not without, sorry, building diverse teams is not without its challenges, but I honestly think that the outcome is richer. Um, a study of 55,000 professionals across 90 countries also found that women generally test as having higher skills in emotional and social intelligence than men, and that the level of a woman, that the level of a manager's emotional intelligence is a key predictor of how long their staff will remain in an organisation. So it's directly linked to organisational sustainability. But I feel a bit hesitant about talking about these sort of studies because many men have amazing skills in terms of emotional and so social intelligence and many women have amazing skills in other areas. Personally, I've certainly felt frustrated when I've been told, oh, you can do the people stuff because you're the girl and girls are good at that stuff. So I don't want people to feel like they've been put in boxes. But building diverse teams in general, not just in terms of gender, will bring a wider range of skill sets. And the very last thing I'd say is that greater general di gender diversity and diversity in general is also good for men. It allows men to both observe and practice different types of leadership that may suit them better personally, but perhaps sit outside a traditional stereotype of what a leader looks like. Thanks, Alice. Um, now, recognising that in organisations and considering the history of women in STEM, um, we need to take a bit more of a proactive approach in recognising and championing the role of women, um, particularly to reduce the barriers that have historically um, faced women in the past. Um, now, Alex, I'd like to defer to you just to share your thoughts on um, the importance of champions in the workplace and how it's um yeah the import yeah how important it is to be a champion for for others in this space. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. I'm looking back over my career so far, I've really been privileged to have a number of champions who have helped me on my journey. Um, these have been both men and women who have been you know, more experienced scientists who have helped to, to guide me, to mentor me, and have really showed that they believe in me, believe in my capability. And they've done this by providing opportunities and new responsibilities, which have helped me to, to grow in my experience by, by undertaking you know, new aspects of work or being in a completely new, situation that's you know really pushed me and they've also helped to expand my network so i think it's really important not only to you know introduce people to to people that might be good collaborators but also to say hey you know you should talk talk to alex because she's an expert in in such and such um, so really to, to advocate on your behalf is has been really powerful for me as well. Um, so that also helps to, to grow your reputation in the field, to expand your network. And I think it's a really great way to help people overcome their, their feeling of it, you know, that imposter syndrome. If you're in a situation because people believe in you and believe in your capability to be there, you're less likely to, to feel like you don't belong because you know that actually you've got the skills because someone else has believed in you and, and put you forward in that role. So I think, you know, looking at myself, I want to put a challenge on myself to actually look, how can I be a champion for others? How can I facilitate that for others? Um, I think it's a role that, that all of us can, can play in that. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Alex. And I myself have definitely benefited from seeing champions in the workplace having that sort of mentor and really show the way um, to make you feel as if like, yeah, you're on the right track and you, you can do all the things. Um, now that we've heard a bit about the, um, the benefit, the shape um, and the contribution of gender equity for organisations, um, it certainly makes sense to try and encourage more women to work in STEM. 
I'd like to touch on um, just the panel's experience um, in this gender equity space themselves. Um, and so, Saleh, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on your professional identity as a woman in STEM. Do you have any thoughts on reducing the barriers that women and girls may face working in STEM, including in remaining in and, and, and um, advancing their STEM careers? Oh, thanks, Matthew. I'll take the first part of your question first. <laughs> Personally, on a day to day basis, I don't bring my gender identity to the fore. I am simply a geoscientist at Geoscience Australia, um, working towards all of the, you know, the wonderful goals of our organisation. So I think that there is a little bit of tension um, in this question because on a day like International Women's Day, I'm a very proud um, identifier as a woman in STEM. So it is a tricky one in terms of identity. Uh, even just yesterday, I got interviewed by the National Library of Australia as part of an oral history project that they're doing on Norfolk Island. So yesterday, I was a proud Norfolk Islander um, and that was the identity that I was wearing on my sleeve, um, despite being International Women's Day. And then now today speaking to you, um, I'm certainly a very proud woman in STEM. So I think it's important to acknowledge the multifaceted identity of everybody. And I think that at times it is okay to be loud and proud and champion as a woman. And at other times, put your head down, do excellent science as an employee of a government organization. So there is no simple answer there for me, except uh, I have the privilege as we all do of wearing a different identity on different occasions. Um, on that sort of multifaceted topic, it's also probably relevant in answer to the second part of your question for me to acknowledge that I would never dare speak on behalf of all women because on panels like this some of the questions they're big right um, I don't have the answers I don't have the solutions but I certainly want to be part of the solution but I want to be the part part of the solution as an individual yes an individual woman in this case but uh, certainly in my own right, with my own opinions and my own experiences. So in answer to the second part of your question, I think acknowledging the diversity in our organisation and the diversity in many organisations from an individual's perspective, and I don't mean that purely from a gender lens, I think part of the solution is reducing barriers to all. So they can be physical barriers, uh, they can be equal access to paid leave opportunities, carer arrangements, um, an inclusive workplace benefits all. And so as a woman, I would very much like to see the cultural initiatives that Geoscience Australia is champion, championing continue in the direction that it is because I know that everybody benefits and Alex certainly touched on this as well as did Alice of course. So I think the culture of being able to bring your authentic self to work, your whole self to work, but also a culture of being able to take it back home intact is very important um, as an individual in an organisation such as this. So it, it, the inclusive culture is the answer and there's a myriad of ways that we can make inclusive culture for everybody, but I know that we all benefit when we focus on being inclusive in a gender sense, with a gender lens and in many other ways as well. So I won't solve that one for you today, Matthew, but um, I'm certainly one that's going to put up my hand to say I'd like to be a part of that change. Thanks so much, Saleh. Well, um, even if you might not solve it single-handedly today, um, thanks for providing such a well thought out and considered answer. Um, and it's also reassuring, I think, to see the greater dialogue on intersectionality and really looking at the more holistic set of barriers that may face people in the workplace, in STEM um, and in society more generally.
Um, speaking on one of these um, other aspects, but with um, a bit more of a, a, a disproportionate impact on women, um, I'm just wondering, Alex, if you could um, share your experience um, as a parent that might have impacted um, your career in STEM. Yeah, certainly, Matthew. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've experienced quite you know, significant disruptions to my career by, by choice, by becoming a parent. And I was really quite nervous before I became a parent as to what, what impact that would have on my career. So I've had you know, two lots of maternity leave, followed by seven years working part time. And so, you know, that, that is a, a lot, of, lot of years out of my career. Um, I was really fortunate that I had extremely supportive managers at the time who, um, you know, did still provide lots of meaningful opportunities for work during that, that period so that I could still grow my experience. Um, but I think one of the things I'd really like to point out is that those years of being a parent are not divorced from your work life. The lessons that you learn as a parent and through a whole range of other life experiences are part of the person that you become and part of the person that you then bring to work. As Saleh said, it's bringing your authentic self to work. And so I think some of the some of the lessons that I've learned in being a parent is how to deal with uncertainty, how to deal with change and complexity. And those are things that are, are really transferable to the workplace. It helps to, to grow your resilience in the face of, of change and, and unpredictability. So, you know, whether it's something small like feeling the first effects of yet another bout of gastro when you're just heading out the door for that you know, finally you're released and have an evening, evening free, plans that are, you know, disrupted yet again, or whether it's, you know, bigger life experiences such as, you know, difficulties in pregnancy or loss or any of those other, other aspects. But for me, these have been lessons that have been, you know, so transferable to, to fieldwork situations. So working on the Antarctic margin, you have to deal with the unpredictability of nature, whether it's the sea ice that, or the massive big iceberg that's sitting right over your sample site that you can no longer get to and you have to make alternative plans or as happened earlier this year, it's, it's COVID throwing a spanner in the work and, you know, thwarting the three years of planning for a, a research voyage that I was to lead. So I think those life experiences do bring resilience. They provide you with that toolkit as a leader and as, as a colleague to help to, you know, to deal with those crises that come up and to, to deal with changes in circumstances in ways that I really hadn't anticipated before embarking on this journey. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, and it sounds like there are some parallels between dealing with gastro at home and potentially gastro um, on an Antarctic expedition. Fortunately, um, haven't had to deal with that yet. Oh, touch wood. Um, I'm just wondering, Saleh, um, especially based on your experience being the mother of a young child, is there anything that you'd like to share on this? Um, potentially advice you give to other women embarking on parenthood whilst advancing their science career? Oh, it's a tricky one, Matthew, as well. <laughs> but thank you for the excellent questions today. Um, I absolutely echo what Alex has put forward. I think the most important thing you can do is be kind to yourself and know that you are not alone in this journey, that many have come before you and many strong and resilient women in particular have come before. The perspective I gained as a recent mum, um, my daughter is about to turn two, the, the perspective I've gained also is, I think, a benefit to what I now bring to work. So like Alex says, I would absolutely uh, celebrate what you gain from parenthood um, as opposed to focus on potential disruptions to the work. Look. It's no secret now that if I wished to, I could not work a 24 hour day 
dedicated to the science of the nation. It's uh, it's simply not the case anymore. However, what I can now bring to the organisation is more strategic, empathetic leadership. I can bring, I'm, I'm more resilient and I can bring an understanding and perspective that sometimes in um, an organisation such as this, that to step back and really assess what's important is uh, is a real benefit. So I have nothing further to add from what Alex did, except to focus on the positives and feel supported by those around you because it's real, even if sometimes it does feel isolating and you do feel like you're letting people down. Thanks so much, Saleh. Um, now, to wrap things up for my interview with the panel directly, um, I'm just wondering, Alice, there's been a lot of talk today about the need for female role models um, as scientists. Considering the persisting inequality and in gender representation across the STEM profession, I'm just wondering how can men like myself, um, specifically those who work in STEM, be good allies in the workplace? Lots of different ways. Um, and I think one of the things that, that men can do is to listen to women, to listen to listen to women's experiences and to try to learn more. So I want to say thank you to you, Matthew, and to all the men who are tuning in today and listening to this panel. Um, that is one of the absolute best things that you can do. One other thing that I would suggest is that, um, that I would really encourage men to think about it and a term that I think sometimes uh, can lead us down a bit of a garden path and cause stress where it doesn't need to is the idea of privilege. So sometimes we talk about men having privilege. Privilege is something that occurs on heaps of different axes. Uh, and some women come in with a lot more ticks in a, in a privilege box than some men. I come to this panel today with a lot of privilege in my background. I come from an English speaking home. I come from a home where I always felt safe. And we need to keep very much in mind our own privilege when talking about privilege with others. But the thing that I would ask men to think about is, when the topic of privilege comes up and we're talking about privilege between men and women, what we don't mean if somebody has privilege is that they haven't potentially worked really, really hard at what they do. Someone who comes into, into the world with a lot of privilege behind them may still and often will have put in extremely long hours of study, extremely long hours at work. They will have become very accomplished. They will have done amazing things. So talking about privilege does not imply that men have not done amazing and awesome and noteworthy work. What it means is that for someone with less privilege, whether that's a woman, whether that's somebody from a different cultural background, whether that's someone from a disability, they may have put in the same hours and the same hard graft and they may not for a variety of reasons have gotten to the same end point. So I'd just like to encourage men, I know it's really hard to please not misinterpret discussions as privilege as a way of us saying that your work doesn't matter and your work isn't worth celebrating. It absolutely is. Thanks, Alice. Um, absolutely, lots of food for thought there about the role of recognising privilege, how it impacts the work that you do every day and how it might have impacted others in the workplace. Um, I'm just going to open the floor to any questions um, that you might feel free to post in the chat. I don't see anything just yet, um, but we've got a little bit of time just for a bit of a more informal Q&A um, with the panel. So um, if you have any questions for those on the line, feel free to post them in the chat um, and we will put them forward. Um, but just to get things started, um, I might circle back to um, some of the introductions today about how you ended up um, working at, at Geoscience Australia and embarking on a career in, in STEM and in earth science. Um, so I'm just wondering what's one thing, um, and this is to the entire panel, what's one thing um, that you wish or you might tell to your 15 year old self about your future career? Um, I might defer to Alex if you'd like to answer that question. Or Alice, I can see you've um, unmuted yourself. <laughs> Alice can go after me. Um, look, I'd say just, you know, to, to follow your passions and to, you know, I had no idea where the road was going to lead me when I was 15. Um, but I followed the things that I enjoyed and I'm so glad that I had that opportunity that to, to just follow what I what I loved and without having to worry about 
you know, what was the career at the end? What does, what does you know, enrolling in geography and anthropology at university actually lead me to? I had no idea, but I was really privileged that I, I could actually follow those passions. And, you know, the, the road certainly wasn't straight. It took me off in different directions. So being open to, to those other opportunities and being prepared to be wrong <laughs> about what you, what you think that, that path is going to be. Thanks, Alex. Um, did you want to share anything, Alice? Okay, good. Um, we've just got one question from Katie in the chat, and I'm just wondering um, who's a woman in science that inspires you? Um, I might go to Saleh for this one. Thanks, Saleh. Not a problem. Um, I'm going to start on sort of um, a reality uh, check for one of my experiences. When I was uh, a young academic um, embarking on a PhD, there were only two women um, who were tenured that I could look up to um, in uh, the Research School of Earth Sciences. And I didn't realise it at the time, but that had a huge influence on me wanting to be one of those women or in addition to those women, not in place of. And I think it had a positive effect on me to see that there were so few because I really saw the need uh, to join that group and to see it grow. What I was able to experience because there only was one or two in those positions um, directly in, in sight for me was to really observe at a very um, detailed level the way they balanced work and home life. These women were were mothers, um, I, I knew their children, and I didn't realise at the time that getting to know someone um, so personally, so seeing them bring their whole selves to work, um, was a way that I think subliminally I realised that it would be possible. Now, of course, moving to uh, Geoscience Australia, again, there's no one woman that I'd like to mention because I'm now surrounded by a group of amazing women. I'm part of a a significant percentage in a in an organization and it's every single one of those women that I can now see and learn from um, that inspires me every day. So I've moved from literally two to the fullness of talent at Geoscience Australia and so that's what inspires me. It's it's the individuals that make up a collective. Thanks so much, Saleh. I might go to one last question uh, from the chat, and that's from James Johnson. Um, James has asked, what's a blind spot of bias that you've encountered as a professional geoscientist? And this sort of touches on um, your answer there, Saleh, about things unseen that are actually really important for mentoring women and reducing those barriers for women in the STEM workplace. Now, did anyone on the panel um, want to field that question? Otherwise, I might defer to someone. Um, I don't see any unmute buttons. Um, I might go to you, Alice. My background is a little more broad in environmental science and I've done a little bit of geoscience, so I'm not sure I'm the, the most appropriate person to answer this question. Um, Dealing with uh, going to the bathroom and different things in the field is an interesting challenge that affects genders differently, but I don't think that's quite what you're after. I Sorry, think... Alice. Um, yeah, actually, just on that note, considering the range of your Antarctic experience, I might um, go to you on this one, Alex, if that's OK. Sorry, Alice. Of course. Oh, that sounds great. <laughs> um, I guess my... Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Um, I wonder if Saleh has some, some good perspectives on this as we just go around the room. <laughs> I am trying to unmute. Um, thanks, James. I, uh, yes, I, there is a blind spot of bias and the, and the other panellists have touched on it. And it's the deferral to, in my experience, the younger woman um, to take the meeting notes, to use their strong organisation skills, to pop the dishwasher on, to bring the cake for morning tea. It's the 
it's the bias in terms of traditional gender stereotypes, which um, does influence sometimes how you spend your minutes and, and hours at work, which may not be dedicated to, to the fullness of the science that your male colleagues may have gone back to their desks to do. So I think that um, there is a blind spot of bias simply in terms of gender roles, which still exists. Um, and I am guilty of perpetuating that as someone that says, not a problem at all, of course I'll pop the dishwasher on. So it's um, it's a role we all have to play to to call it out, as well as for um, our, our male friends to say, don't worry about that Saleh this week, I'll I'll take that one, um, I'll bring in the cake. So it's um it's it's a tricky one because you do always want to be helpful and contributing, um, but the bias in terms of who takes what role can still sometimes creep in. Thanks so much Saleh. And I think um just based on my own observations working in geoscience, in earth science, in mining, um recognizing that bias about say who can carry that core tray, who can lift that rock. Um, sometimes some of the, the people that you're working with, regardless of gender, um, are actually probably best place to do that. Um, and yeah, check the bias and your own prejudice there as well. Um, we are running slightly over time, so I might just wrap things up for today. But first and foremost, um, I'd like to thank, sincerely thank our panelists, Alex, Alice and Saleh for their candor and humor. Um, in sharing their stories here today. I know I've gotten a lot, a lot out of this and I hope um, the floor has gotten a lot, a lot out of this as well. And thank you all for taking the time out of your day to listen to the experiences of these incredible women. I'd also like to thank Alison and Erica again for their introductions. Um, it's terrific to hear the great progress being made to improve gender equity within Geoscience Australia. Finally, big shout out to Jenga's Women's Network and Geoscience Australia's Diversity and Inclusion team for their work in pulling this event together, along with Jenga's executive sponsor, David Robinson, for his ongoing support, as well as Chris Nelson and Robert Blythe for their assistance in hosting this panel today. If you're from Geoscience Australia and you'd like to participate in more events like this, please consider joining Jenga, that is the Gender Equity Network at Geoscience Australia. You can find out more on how to join um, via the internet. I also encourage you all to take a look at our new domestic and family violence policy and procedure, along with the e-learning modules mentioned, um, which are now available on the internet. Finally, just wrapping up today's Wednesday seminar, next week there'll be a buy in this series. The Wednesday seminar will return on March 23rd when Rachel Nansen will present on Cretaceous to Cenozoic controls on the genesis of the shelf incising Perth Canyon, insights from a two-part geomorphology mapping approach to describe the evolution of the Perth Canyon, um, which is one of Australia's largest submarine canyons um, with cliff walls of over one kilometre high, plunges from 170 metres to five kilometres below sea level. Um, you can find out more at that seminar. That concludes the formalities for today. Take care. Thanks so much again to the panel um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now.